Welcome, everybody. I think we all appreciate the fact that we are living in challenging times, especially for Christians, especially for any family that's just trying to be halfway normal and healthy. It's not an easy time to raise a Christian family. We all recognize that. The 20th century in particular was very difficult. There were more martyrs in the 20th century than all the other centuries of Christianity combined. And other popes have commented on this particularly difficult century. Now, interestingly enough, when Pope Benedict was in Fatima, during his homily there, he had this to say. In seven years, you will return here to celebrate the centenary, the 100th anniversary of the first visit made by the lady come from heaven. We would be mistaken to think that Fatima's prophetic mission is complete. In sacred scripture, we often find that God seeks righteous men and women in order to save the city of man. And he does the same here in Fatima. And then at the end of his homily, he prayed, May the seven years which separate us from the centenary of the apparitions hasten the fulfillment of the prophecy of the triumph of the Immaculate Heart of Mary to the glory of the Most Holy Trinity. And there's a great quote from Pope Pius XII, which reads, If we are to have peace, we must all obey the requests made at Fatima. The time for doubting Fatima is long past. It is now time for action. And again, I want to stress, we can prevent wars and natural disasters by accepting Our Lady's invitation to pray the rosary every day for peace. And if you don't believe me, listen to this story. In 1960, Nikita Khrushchev visited the UN. It was in October. And he boasted that the Soviet Union would bury the United States. In fact, he took off his shoe and he pounded it on the desk in front of the whole UN assembly. And he terrified everybody. Thankfully, John the 23rd, Pope John the 23rd, and the Bishop of Fatima responded immediately. And they issued a letter to all the bishops of the world, inviting them to hold a vigil of prayer on October 12th to the 13th, praying to Our Lady of Fatima for peace. That was the gist of the prayer vigil. And so on the night of October 12th, despite a penetrating rain that chilled them to the bone, about one million pilgrims spent the night in prayer at the shrine of Our Lady of Fatima. And at least 300 other dioceses around the world joined them in prayer that night. Well, on that same night between October 12th and the 13th, right after his shoe-pounding episode, Khrushchev suddenly pulled up stakes and took off for Moscow in all haste. Why was that? Because Marshall Nedelin and the best minds in Russia on nuclear energy were present for the final testing of the missile that was going to be presented to Khrushchev. When countdown was completed, the missile, for some reason or other, did not leave the launch pad. After about 15 minutes, Nedelin and all others came out of the bomb shelter. When they did, the missile exploded, killing over 300 people. This set back Russia's nuclear program for 20 years and prevented all-out atomic warfare. This happened on the night when the whole Catholic world was on its knees before the Blessed Sacrament gathered at the feet of Our Lady of Fatima. Isn't that amazing? For those of you who do not know where Fatima is, it's in Portugal on the west coast of Europe. And Fatima, the city, is about 70 miles northeast of Lisbon. And at the end of the talk, I have a surprise for you all regarding the origin of the name Fatima. So in case you are saying to yourself, what relevance does this apparition of the Blessed Mother to three shepherd children have to me? It happened back in 1917. What relevance does it still have today? Well, listen to these words from Cardinal Angelo Sedano, who was the Secretary of State under Pope John Paul II. He said, even if the events of Fatima now seem part of the past, Our Lady's call to conversion and penance issued at the beginning of the 20th century remains timely and urgent today. The Lady of the Message seems to read the signs of the times, the signs of our time, with special insight. The insistent invitation of Mary Most Holy to penance is nothing but the manifestation of her maternal concern for the fate of the human family. 
in need of conversion and forgiveness. So he spoke those words back in 2000. It was May 13th, the year 2000, when two of the three shepherd children were beatified right in Fatima. And on that same day, John Paul II wanted to reveal what the third secret of Fatima was. As you listen to this talk, it'll help to keep in mind the number three, because it comes up over and over again. You've got the three shepherd children, the three visionaries. You have the three apparitions of the Angel of Peace, which occurred in 1916. The Angel of Peace prepared the children for the apparitions of Our Lady. Then you have the three secrets, as we have come to know them, which were given during the third apparition of Our Lady in July of 1917. And then you have these three prayer intentions that come up over and over again. The conversion of sinners, the salvation of souls, and praying in reparation for the sins of the world. So let's just take a quick look at the three shepherd children. You've got Jacinta and Francisco. They were brother and sister. And when the angel of peace appeared to them, Jacinta was six and Francisco was eight. And then their first cousin, Lucia, was nine. So they were very young. Lucia was definitely gifted with a, a good intellect. She was just six years old when she received her first communion, which was rather unusual for that time. Today it's not so unusual, perhaps, but most of the kids were at least 10 years old in her first communion class. But she proved to her pastor that she was smart enough. When she went to make her first confession, I guess she made it so loudly that everybody in the church could hear it, except for the last part. And that was what the priest shared with her. It was his counsel to her. For her penance, she was asked to go and pray before the altar of Our Lady of the Rosary. There was a statue there of Our Lady, and Lucia said that as she was praying her penance before Our Lady, Our Lady smiled at her. The statue became animated a little bit and, and made that kind gesture. And of course, that motivated Lucia. And her mother as well. Lucia's mother was also very encouraging and supportive of her spiritual life. And she said to her, Above all, ask him... Jesus, to make you a saint when you receive him in Holy Communion tomorrow. And then the day of her first communion, she believed that Jesus spoke to her heart. Jesus said to her, The grace granted to you this day will remain living in your soul, producing fruits of eternal life. And after this, Lucia said, she lost all taste and attraction for the things of the world. So already as a young girl, she was very much in love with Jesus. These words describing Francisco were spoken by John Paul II on the occasion of his beatification in May of 2000. And here's what the Holy Father said. One night, Francisco's father heard Francisco sobbing and asked him why he was crying. His son answered, I was thinking of Jesus, who is so sad because of the sins that are committed against him. Francisco was motivated by one desire, to console Jesus and make him happy. Francisco bore without complaining the great sufferings caused by the Spanish flu from which he died at the age of 11. It all seemed to him so little to console Jesus. He died with a smile on his lips. And he died just a few years after the apparitions. He died April 4th, 1919. His younger sister, Jacinta, died just about a year after him. And here's what John Paul had to say about Jacinta. One day, when she and Francisco had already contracted the illness that forced them to bed, the Virgin Mary came to visit them at home. As the little one recounts, Our Lady came to see us and said that soon she would come and take Francisco to heaven. And she asked me if I still wanted to convert more sinners. I told her yes. And when the time came for Francisco to leave, the little girl tells him, Give my greetings to our Lord and to our Lady and tell them that I am enduring everything they want for the conversion of sinners. Jacinta had been so deeply moved by the vision of hell during the apparition of July 13th that no mortification or penance seemed too great to save sinners. So it seems that each of the children embraced one of those three prayer intentions in a particular way. For Jacinta, it was the conversion of sinners. For Francisco, it was making reparation and, and consoling the heart of Jesus. And then for Lucia, it would have been for the salvation of souls. Interesting thing to note, when Francisco and Jacinta were beatified, it was the first time that the church recognized the fact that children could practice heroic virtue. We had child martyrs 
They shed their blood for their faith. But never had the church declared that a child actually practiced heroic virtue. So this was a first in the history of the church. So just in case you're saying to yourself, well, if the Blessed Virgin Mary appeared to me, I would be a saint too. Well, Pope Benedict debunks that argument. He said in 2007, Their holiness does not depend on the apparitions, but on their fidelity and commitment in responding to the extraordinary gift they received from the Lord and from Mary Most Holy. So the messages these children received were not just for them, but they are for all of us. They are for the whole world, and they are still important today. These words that I'm about to read were spoken by Cardinal Bertone. He is the current Secretary of State under Pope Benedict, and he wrote a book on Fatima. And as he was presenting it for the first time to Pope Benedict, he said this, The mystery of Fatima is an event that has affected and permeated contemporary history more than any other Marian apparition. And the fullness of its message touches the hearts of human beings, inviting them to conversion and to co-responsibility for the world's salvation. Cardinal Bertone continues, Its message obliges today's men and women to reckon with a supernatural dimension that they are not always prepared to consider. Even for believers, the idea of a supernatural intrusion into earthly events can be difficult to accept. We'll get into these apparitions now of the Angel of Peace. When he first appeared to the children in the spring of 1916, he said, Do not be afraid. I am the Angel of Peace. Pray with me. And then he taught them this prayer. Let's pray it together. My God, I believe, I adore, I hope, and I love you. I beg pardon for those who do not believe, do not adore, do not hope, and do not love you. And then he said, pray thus. The hearts of Jesus and Mary are attentive to the voice of your supplications. All right, and this is known today as the pardon prayer. Very simple. Well, as is typical of little kids, they were very impressed, of course, by this apparition of the angel. And for, for weeks, they were pretty devout and fervent in their prayer. But as is typical, they got distracted and they weren't quite as diligent in their prayers. And so the angel of peace comes back in the summertime and he says, what are you doing? Pray, pray very much. The most holy hearts of Jesus and Mary have designs of mercy on you. Offer prayers and sacrifices constantly to the Most High. Make everything you can a sacrifice and offer it to God as an act of reparation for the sins by which he is offended and in supplication for the conversion of sinners. Above all, accept and bear with submission the suffering which the Lord will send you. So this is a pretty sober message for three little kids. Remember, they are six, eight, and nine. So then there's the third apparition of the angel of peace. And he appeared to them holding the chalice and above the chalice the host. And then he, he let go of them and they stayed suspended in midair. And then he came down around to the children and he taught them this prayer. We can pray together. O most holy trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, I adore you profoundly. I offer you the most precious body, blood, soul, and divinity of our Lord Jesus Christ, really and truly present in all the tabernacles of the world, in reparation for the countless outrages, sacrileges, and indifference by which he is offended. And through the infinite merits of the sacred heart of Jesus and the immaculate heart of Mary, I beg you to convert poor sinners." And then he gave the chalice to Jacinta and Francisco, and he gave the host to Lucia. And he said, Take and drink the body and blood of Jesus Christ, horribly outraged by ungrateful men. Make reparation for their crimes and console your God. So again, a, a rather sober message for such young children. But Lucia commented later that for her, one of the central messages of Fatima was Eucharistic adoration and making reparation to the Eucharistic heart of Jesus. Put very simply, Mary was trying to remind the world that God is really and truly present in the Eucharist. It is his real presence. And that's something that a lot of people don't understand. But it's what we've always believed as Catholics. And that's what's so awesome about our God, that he wants to be so close to us and so intimate. 
So now as we delve into the apparitions of Mary and the messages, let's keep in mind that we can make a difference by our prayers, by our sacrifices, by offering all that we do to God. We can make a difference in the world. So on May 13th, 1917, Our Lady first appeared to the three shepherd children and she assured them, I will do you no harm. And Lucia asked her, where are you from? And Mary said, I am from heaven. And then Lucia asked, what do you want of us? Mary said, I came to ask you to come here on the 13th day for six months at this same time. And then I will tell you who I am and what I want. Mary did not tell the children that she was the Blessed Virgin Mary at first. And then Lucia, seeing how beautiful Mary was, knowing that she came from heaven anyway, said, will I go to heaven? And Mary said, yes, you will. Would you like to offer yourselves to God to accept all the sufferings which he may send you in reparation for the countless sins by which he is offended and in supplication for the conversion of sinners? Lucia nodded yes. Then Mary said, you will have much to suffer, but the grace of God will be your comfort. And then before she departed, Mary said, pray the rosary every day in order to obtain peace for the world and the end of the war. At this time, World War I was going on. It had not yet ended. And so Mary was encouraging them to pray the rosary to end the war. Well, as promised, Mary returned on the 13th of June. And again, Lucia asked, My lady, what do you want of me? Mary responded, I want you to come here on the 13th day of next month and to pray the rosary every day. And I want you to learn to read. Lucia was now 10 years old and she still didn't know how to read which back then was probably not all that uncommon. Again, Lucia insisting on going to heaven. I would like to ask you to take us to heaven. Mary said, yes, I will take Francisco and Jacinta soon, but you must remain on earth for some time. Jesus wishes to use you to make me better known and loved. He wishes to establish in the world devotion to my immaculate heart. And Lucia became a nun and she lived into her 90s. She died in 2005. So she was there in the year 2000 for the beatification of her childhood friends. How about that? Well, now we get to the most famous of the apparitions, the July 13th apparition, the third apparition, where the three secrets of Fatima were revealed by Our Lady. And the first secret, as we have come to know it, was a vision of hell that the children had. They were literally transported to hell in the spirit, you could say. And Mary told them, You saw hell, where the souls of poor sinners go. In order to save them, God wishes to establish in the world devotion to my immaculate heart. And then she taught them what we all know today as the Fatima prayer. She said, When you say the rosary, say after each mystery, O oh my Jesus, forgive us our sins, save us from the fires of hell, and lead all souls to heaven, especially those who are in most need of thy mercy. And then she said, sacrifice yourselves for sinners and say often this little sacrifice prayer. Oh, my Jesus, this is for love of you, for the conversion of sinners, and in reparation for the offenses committed against the Immaculate Heart of Mary. So there's a simple little prayer that we can all say or something like it. But whenever we're doing something that requires a little bit of an effort, of a special effort, when we're, whenever we're making a little sacrifice, we can pray something like this and then it, it just reminds us of the value that that act has in the eyes of God. Well, why did she take the children to hell in the spirit? Why did she want them to see this? And I think it was to remind the world that hell does exist. It's not that God wants people to go there because he doesn't, but it does exist. And the catechism itself says, the teaching of the church affirms the existence of hell and its eternity. The chief punishment of hell is eternal separation from God in whom alone man can possess the life and happiness for which he was created and for which he longs. And of course, Jesus often speaks of Gehenna, of the unquenchable fire reserved for those who to the end of their lives refuse to believe and be converted. And John Paul II had a good way of reflecting on this. He said, it's not that God sends people to hell, but for some mysterious reason, people choose to go there. It's really the culmination of a lifetime of choices to reject God's love and mercy. So then the second secret had to do with World War I and the possibility of World War II. Listen to what Mary said. 
I want you to continue to pray the rosary every day in honor of Our Lady of the Rosary in order to obtain peace for the world and end the war, for she alone can help. If people do what I ask, many souls will be saved and there will be peace. The war is going to end, but if people do not stop offending God, another, even worse, will begin in the reign of Pius XI. That's when Germany invaded Austria in 1938. To prevent it, I shall come to ask for the consecration of Russia to my Immaculate Heart and the communion of reparation on the first Saturdays. If people attend to my requests, Russia will be converted and the world will have peace. If not, Russia will spread its errors throughout the world, fomenting wars and persecutions of the church. The good will be martyred, the Holy Father will have much to suffer, and various nations will be annihilated. Well, unfortunately... People did not attend to Our Lady's requests, and World War II resulted. The third secret was a vision that the kids had, more of an internal vision. I liken it to a snapshot of the 20th century. Church scholars say that there were more martyrs in the 20th century than the other 19 centuries of Christianity combined. So here's how Lucia describes what they saw. At the left of Our Lady, and a little above, we saw an angel with a flaming sword in his left hand. Flashing, it gave out flames that looked as though they would set the world on fire. But they died out when they came in contact with the splendor that Our Lady radiated towards him from her right hand. Pointing to the earth with his right hand, the angel cried out in a loud voice, Penance! 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 And then they saw a bishop dressed in white we had the impression that it was the Holy Father. Other bishops, priests, men and women religious, going up a steep mountain, at the top of which there was a big cross. Before reaching there, the Holy Father passed through a big city, half in ruins and half trembling with halting step, afflicted with pain and sorrow. He prayed for the souls of the corpses he met on his way. Having reached the top of the mountain, on his knees at the foot of the big cross, he was killed by a group of soldiers who fired bullets and arrows at him. And in the same way, there died one after another, the other bishops, priests, men and women religious, and various lay people of different ranks and positions. Beneath the two arms of the cross, there were two angels, each with a crystal aspersorium in his hand. The aspersorium is what a priest uses to bless people with, typically with holy water. It's the wand with the ball at the end of it that has holes in it, and he blesses you with that. And in these aspersorium, they gathered up the blood of the martyrs and with it sprinkled the souls that were making their way to God. So for decades, this vision was not known. This third secret had not been revealed until the year 2000. And John Paul wanted to reveal it finally because he believes that it was fulfilled to some degree when he was shot in St. Peter's Square. And we remember that he was shot on May 13th, 1981. May 13th, the feast of Our Lady of Fatima. And he said that it was Our Lady's hand that guided the bullet and saved his life. You could say that one finger pulled the trigger that day and another finger guided the bullet. So goal is to show that our prayers and the fact that John Paul II consecrated himself to Mary, he consecrated his papacy to Mary, that we can change history. Perhaps he was meant to die, just like the children saw in their vision. But it was Our Lady that saved his life, and God heard the prayers of the faithful. God honored John Paul's life and consecration to Mary and spared his life. We recall that his papal model was Todus Tus, Todus Tus, Ego Sum Maria. I am all yours, Mary. I am totally yours. And Mary saved his life. So, again, we can make a difference by our prayers and sacrifices. In that second secret, Mary talked about the five first Saturdays. She said that she would come back to ask for those five first Saturdays. And she did so on December 10th, 1925. She appeared to Lucia, who was now a nun, and she appeared holding the child Jesus. And the child Jesus first spoke to Lucia. He said, Have compassion on the heart of your most holy mother, covered with thorns with which ungrateful men pierce it at every moment, and there is no one to make an act of reparation. 
And then Mary said, You at least try to console me and say that I promise to assist at the hour of death with the graces necessary for salvation all those who on the first Saturday of five consecutive months shall confess, receive Holy Communion, recite five decades of the Rosary, and keep me company for 15 minutes while meditating on 15 mysteries of the Rosary with the intention of making reparation to me. And what are we making reparation for? Five things. That's why there are five first Saturdays. We are praying in reparation for those who blaspheme her Immaculate Conception, for those who blaspheme her perpetual virginity, for those who blaspheme Mary as the mother of God and our mother, for those who keep children away from Mary, and for those who dishonor Mary in her statues and works of art. Four years later, on June 13, 1929, Lucia was praying in the chapel at her convent, and she had this vision. It was a vision of the Holy Trinity and of Mary. She describes it. She says, Suddenly the whole chapel was illuminated by a supernatural light, and above the altar appeared a cross of light reaching to the ceiling. In a brighter light on the upper part of the cross could be seen the face of a man and his body as far as the waist. Upon his breast was a dove of light. Nailed to the cross was the body of another man. A little below the waist I could see a chalice and a large host suspended in the air onto which drops of blood were falling from the face of Jesus crucified and from the wound in his side. These drops ran down onto the host and fell into the chalice. Beneath the right arm of the cross was Our Lady and in her hand was her immaculate heart. Under the left arm of the cross, large letters as if of crystal clear water which ran down upon the altar formed these words, grace and mercy. And then Our Lady said, The moment has come in which God asks the Holy Father, in union with all the bishops of the world, to make the consecration of Russia to my Immaculate Heart, promising to save it by this means. Now, unfortunately, this did not happen until 1984. Finally, on March 25th, 1984, John Paul II, in union with all the bishops of the world, consecrated Russia to the Immaculate Heart of Mary. And Lucia did confirm that heaven accepted this consecration. That's debated today, I understand, but we are going to take Lucia for her word. Now we're just going to skip ahead to the sixth apparition of October 13th, 1917. This apparition was much anticipated because the children told the townspeople and, and those that would come periodically to talk with them that Our Lady was going to give a sign, that there would be some sign that everybody could witness that would confirm that in fact Our Lady was appearing to the children and that what the children were saying was true. And so Lucia stated that during Mary's final visit, they were given three visions of Mary. In the first, she appeared with the Holy Family. Mary appeared to the right of the Son. To the Son's left, St. Joseph appeared holding the Christ child in his arms, both tracing the sign of the cross with their hands. Lucia stated that Mary also appeared as Our Lady of Sorrows and as Our Lady of Mount Carmel. And it's interesting to note that the brown scapular was revealed to St. Simon Stock, the prior general of the Carmelite order in 1247. The Virgin Mary appeared to him and gave him the scapular. She promised that whosoever dies wearing the brown scapular shall not suffer eternal fire. So that's Our Lady of Mount Carmel. And the scapular is really a sign of our consecration to Mary. And Lucia said that Our Lady wants all to wear the scapular. The scapular and the rosary are inseparable. All right, so it's just not that we wear this piece of cloth around our neck, but it's that we also remind ourselves of who we are as children of Mary and that we consecrate ourselves to her and, and try to live the will of God according to our state in life. That's really what that's all about. So then, after these visions that the children saw, the miracle of the sun occurred. This was the sign that everybody was waiting for. And they got a big one. In fact, this, this miracle is only the second miracle in history that we know of that was performed at a specific time, at a specific place, in order to prove something. And the first miracle of that kind was the resurrection of the Lord. We read throughout the Gospels that Jesus said, 
I will go up to Jerusalem, I will be crucified, and on the third day I will rise. So he predicted that a few different times. But here in Fatima, on October 13th, 1917, the miracle of the sun occurred. And that day it had been raining. It, in fact, it had been pouring rain. The field was soaked. It was muddy. People's clothes were soaked. It was cold. And then all of a sudden, the sky opened up. The sun came out. People's clothes dried immediately. The ground dried up immediately. And people could look directly into the sun. It was spinning. It was swirling. It was pulsating. It even appeared as if it were coming to the ground. People were terrified at times. And they would be confessing their sins out loud and praying the act of contrition. And this started and stopped three times in 12 minutes. People couldn't deny it. Some people who were lame were able to walk. Some blind people regained their sight. And this just wasn't a few people. There were at least 50,000 people in the field and maybe another 20,000 in the surrounding towns. So at least 70,000 people witnessed the miracle of the sun that day. Even the secular newspapers had to acknowledge this miracle. The century a Portuguese newspaper posted a picture of the three shepherd children on the front page and ran a headline that read, How the sun danced in the sky at midday in Fatima. The story was circulating everywhere. This was an awesome miracle. And it confirmed that Our Lady was there and that Our Lady was speaking to these children. Some theologians have related this miracle of the sun to the book of Revelation, chapter 12 which reads, A great sign appeared in the sky, a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and on her head a crown of twelve stars. She was with child and wailed aloud in pain as she labored to give birth. Then another sign appeared in the sky. It was a huge red dragon. Interestingly, it was a red dragon, like red Russia and today red China. The dragon became angry with the woman, and went off to wage war against the rest of her offspring, those who keep God's commandments and bear witness to Jesus. So this woman, referred to there in the book of Revelation, was also referenced in Genesis. In Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, we read, and this is God the Father speaking to Satan, I will put enmity between you and the woman, not Eve, but Mary, and between your seed and her seed, her seed being Jesus. So scripture scholars refer to this verse in Genesis chapter 3 as the Proto-Evangelium, the first gospel. This is the first hint of God's salvific plan. Because God's initial plan did not include pain and suffering and death. But because of sin, death entered the world and pain and suffering. But God was just not going to abandon us. Well, God was trying to warn us. He did send a message to his vicar. Now, interestingly enough, back in 1884, exactly 33 years to the day prior to the great miracle of the sun in Fatima, that is, on October 13, 1884, Pope Leo XIII had a remarkable vision. When the aged pontiff had finished celebrating Mass in his private Vatican chapel, attended by a few cardinals and members of the Vatican staff, Pope Leo XIII suddenly stopped at the foot of the altar. He stood there for about ten minutes as if in a trance, his face ashen white. Then going immediately from the chapel to his office, he composed the prayer to St. Michael, the archangel. With instructions, it be said, after all low masses everywhere throughout the universal church. So I'm sure many of you are familiar with the prayer to St. Michael, the archangel. Well, this is the origin of that prayer. 1884, after this vision that Pope Leo XIII had. And of course, you're all asking yourselves, what did he see? What did he hear? Well, when asked what had happened, he explained that as he was about to leave the foot of the altar, he suddenly heard voices, two voices, one kind and gentle, the other guttural and harsh. They seemed to come from near the tabernacle. As he listened, he heard the following conversation. Satan in his pride boasted to our Lord, I can destroy your church. The gentle voice of our Lord, you can, then go ahead and do so. Satan responded, to do so, I need more time and more power. Our Lord responded, how much time, how much power? 
Satan said, 75 to 100 years, and a greater power over those who will give themselves over to my service. Our Lord said, you have the time, you will have the power. Do with them what you will. Now when I sent this to my mom, I, I emailed it to her, and she responded right away, please call me. <laughs> this is kind of disturbing. And so I called her up right away, and I said, Mom, let's keep in mind two things. One, this is a conversation that is not completely unprecedented because my mom was asking, why would God even allow Satan to even approach his throne? Why would he grant such, a, such an audience, right? I reminded her that in the book of Job, we read that God the Father is there boasting about his good servant Job, and the devil comes up to him and says, well, yeah, he's so good because you don't let me tempt him. You know, you don't let me try to trip him up. And God says, all right, you can try to trip him up, you can test him, but you can't kill him, that's all. And we know that Job went through a lot. I mean, he, he lost his children, he lost his flocks, his cattle and everything. And through it all, Job did not blaspheme the Lord. He has that famous line, The Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Well, we have to keep in mind that God is eternal, that he's outside of time, and that the church is his bride. And he loves his church. He loves us. He wants to care for us. And he wants us to be holy. And so he knew that his church needed to be purified. His bride needed to be better. She needed to be holier. And so I believe that the Lord was preparing his vicar and his church for the very difficult 20th century, a time of purification, not just for the church, but for humanity. Well, listen to this story. Some of you may know that after World War II, the Soviets occupied a quarter of Austria. And there was a Franciscan priest, Father Pavlicek, who had had just about enough of the Soviet occupation, and so he organized the crusade of the rosary and repentance. He asked that 10% of all Austrians commit to praying the rosary every day for the departure of the Soviets. He got 500,000 to commit to praying the rosary every day. And seven years later, after he started this campaign, the Soviets packed their bags and left Austria. And Teresa Newman, the famous German stigmatic, confirmed that the Soviets left because of all the rosaries said by the Austrian people. There was really no good reason for them to leave, but they left anyway. Another neat story. This one is closer to our day. Just a couple of months after John Paul consecrated Russia to the Immaculate Heart of Mary, on the feast of Our Lady of Fatima, May 13, 1984, one of the largest crowds in Fatima history gathers at the shrine to pray the rosary for peace. And again, on that very same day, an explosion at a Soviet naval base destroys two-thirds of all the missiles stockpiled for the Soviet's northern fleet. Western military experts call it the worst naval disaster the Soviet Navy suffered since World War II. And then we all know that on November 9, 1989, the Berlin Wall fell. And then it was December 25th, Christmas Day, 1991, that the Soviet Union was dissolved. So all of these things happened around Our Lady of Fatima, you know, days that were significant to this devotion. Well, in closing, I told you that I had a surprise, and I want to talk for a minute about the origin of the name Fatima. The Koran, which is the Bible for Muslims, has many passages concerning the Blessed Virgin Mary. The only possible serious rival to her in their creed would be Fatima, the daughter of Muhammad himself. Muhammad is the founder of Islam. And he himself wrote of his daughter, you will be the most blessed of all women in paradise after Mary. How about that? So Muslims occupied Portugal for centuries. But when they were finally being driven out, the last Muslim chief had a beautiful daughter by the name of Fatima. And she fell in love with this Catholic prince. And she stayed behind. She marries him and converts to Catholicism. And he was so happy with, with his new wife and with everything that had transpired that he renamed his land holdings Fatima. So of all the places in the world that our Blessed Mother could have appeared in 1917, she chose a little town in Portugal by the name of Fatima. And so you can see what God is trying to do, I think, through the Immaculate Heart of Mary. He is trying to unite humanity under the Immaculate Heart of Mary. 
Somebody pointed out to me the other day that in 2017, Protestants will celebrate the 500th anniversary of the Reformation. It was October 31st, 1517, that Martin Luther nailed those 95 theses on the door. And so it's the 500th anniversary of the Reformation. It's the 100th anniversary of Fatima. It's this place with a name that is revered by Muslims. And you can just see that God will do something very special to bring all of us together, to unite us all in Christ, finally. So I think that has to be our prayer, that just as Jesus prayed at the Last Supper, that we all be one, we too have to echo that prayer and pray that we can all be one in Christ through the intercession of Our Lady of Fatima. In closing tonight, why don't we pray these words by Pope Benedict when he was in Fatima. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Our Lady, Mother of all men and women, we come before you as your sons and daughters and present to your immaculate heart all our joys and hopes, as well as our problems and sufferings. Mother most gentle, you know each one of us by name. You know our faces and our personal stories. And you love us all with maternal benevolence that wells up from the very heart of divine love. We entrust ourselves to you and consecrate ourselves to you. Mary most holy, Mother of God and our Mother. Amen. St. Michael the Archangel, defend us in battle. Be our safeguard against the wickedness and snares of the devil. May God rebuke him, we humbly pray. And do thou, O Prince of the heavenly host, by the power of God, cast into hell Satan and all the evil spirits who prowl around the world, seeking the ruin of souls. Amen. And Our Lady of Fatima, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.